Good morning, friends. Welcome to worship on this first Sunday of Advent. Yep, it's already here. And whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We're pleased to be able to light the first Advent candle today, the candle of hope. And perhaps you can join us at home in lighting the candle in this ritual. If you have a candle handy, we also have Advent wreaths available. Pastor Julia has made a, a lot of them available and many have already taken them. We've got some more. If you wanna go on our website and see the information about that or email Pastor Julia and she can get you an Advent wreath for you and your household for these four Sundays in this Advent season. We're also going to have our mitten tree with hats and scarves as well. And this year, it'll be out in the front entry courtyard near our front door at Third and Bluff. And we will be inviting donations of new mittens and scarves and hats in the next week or two. So stay tuned for more information about that. Thank you. We're grateful to our musicians who have contributed to our music today, uh, Dave and Evan Vorpal and Bill Bourne, and Jeff Britton, Kate Tinker, and Lisa Kepsel. Next weekend, we will have a little treat on Sunday night. We're going to show a film. It's put out by The Work of the People, and it's called Adventus. And it's uh, some leading theologians, thought leaders in the church talking about what Advent means. And we'll have it available for you to watch anytime next weekend. And then at seven o'clock on Sunday evening, this is December 6th, you can join Pastor Julia and me in a Zoom call and we'll have a conversation about the film Adventus. So stay tuned for email about that. Let us join together in our responsive call to worship. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh. Stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Let your hand be upon the one at your right hand, the one whom you made strong for yourself. Then we will never turn back from you. Give us life and we will call on your name. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. i 
Let us join in our opening prayer. Come, O Advent God, and reveal your promise in us now. Our cry is one of longing, O God, for a restored relationship with you. As we enter the season of Advent, our longing is great. It can be hard to find you in our world, yet we believe you are here with us, renewing all that is broken, Come among us and in flesh, abide with us, that we may witness your presence around us and be filled with a new vision of your world. Amen. And this being the first Sunday in Advent, we are so pleased that the Kepsel family will be lighting the candle of hope. The Gospel of John speaks of Christ as the true light coming into the world. In commemoration of that coming, we light candles for the four weeks leading to Christmas and reflect on the coming of Christ. It is significant that the church has always used that language, the coming of Christ, because it speaks to a deep truth. Christ is coming. Christ is always coming, always entering a troubled world, a wounded heart. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 2. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. We light the first candle, the candle of hope, and dare to express our longing for peace, for healing, and the well-being of all creation. Now let, let us all join together. Loving God, as we enter this Advent season, we open all the dark places in our lives and memories to the healing light of Christ. Show us the creative power of hope. We prepare our lives to transform it by you, that we may walk in the light of Christ. Amen. In this season of giving, we have a wonderful opportunity to reach out into the community through our annual Christmas giving tree. We are really excited to be able to offer this ministry even during the pandemic. We've had to make some changes to make it possible, but we have 16 families that have been identified by Carla Vorpal through the social work department at the school, Sheboygan Schools. And we have collected a wish list from all of them, and we've put it online. And so you can find that wish list and sign up for a gift. You can either go to our website, or you can look in the e-post, or just send me an email, and I will help connect you. And then we invite you to uh, purchase that gift and bring it back by December 13th, only two weeks. So we're really encouraging people to, to get involved in this. If you don't feel comfortable going out and purchasing a gift, that's all right. You can uh, send a check 
and just write on it Giving Tree. And we will use that money either to purchase some of the presents that don't get sponsored, or also we're hoping to give food cards. And so it's a wonderful, very important ministry, and we hope that everyone can be involved. Um, also, we are in our stewardship season, and we're receiving pledges um, through the mail or either online. And we have had a theme this year called FCC Gives Hope. And we are thankful that uh, Roxanne Akshilevitz, who is our Sunday School Coordinator, she has made a, a short video about how FCC gives her hope. Let's watch it together. I'm Roxanne Estelevich, and I'm the Sunday School Coordinator for FCC. Since April, I've been the Zoom Sunday School teacher. Each Sunday morning here at my computer, we have two Zoom classes, one for the younger children and one for the older children. We share a lesson, sometimes read a storybook, and let the children share the joys and concerns that are on their minds. It's a great time of hearing the stories and talking about what they mean to us and for our lives. One thing that we haven't been able to do during Zoom Sunday School is a hands-on activity or craft. So this past month, I created Thanksgiving bags for all of the Sunday School children. They were delivered to 58 children of our church, aged four through fifth grade. One of the most important things inside was a note to let them know how thankful we are to have them as part of our church family. There was also a small treat and activities to think about things for which they're thankful. A giving thanks tree and a giving thanks mindfulness page. One thing I like about the Sunday School lessons each week is a visual piece that helps explain the lesson like leaves that fall down on us like blessings and show us how we can be a blessing to others. Shoes that remind us to share God's love with those whose life is a walk different from our own. And many things from nature when we talked about creation and caring for the earth. There's one I'd like to share from a lesson about being called to share Jesus' loving care with one another. It is a difficult job and can be tough to do on our own, like a single sheet of paper that can easily be torn without any support. But now think of a stack of papers. It's impossible to tear even one sheet. This is how I feel our Sunday School family and FCC give hope, reminding us that we are not on our own, but that we are stronger together. The Gospel reading in the lectionary for this first Sunday of Advent is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 13, beginning with verse 24. The Christ is saying, But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you will know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware. Keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, 
or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. Here ends our reading from Mark's Gospel. We've now entered the season of Advent, a time of waiting and hoping for God's redemption. The scriptures today speak to this theme. I'd like to speak to you about the three W's of Advent, the Holy Trinity, if you will, waiting, watching, and arithmetic. No, waiting, watching, and waking up. Imagine three legs of a stool or three points of a triangle. These are inextricably linked, interrelated. We wait while we watch. We watch while we wait. And hopefully we will wake up in the process. The first word, waiting, it's what Advent is all about. The word Adventus in Latin means arrival or coming. The Greek word was parousia referring to the second coming of Christ, the return of Christ. We're waiting for Christ to be born again in our hearts, in our world. Waiting is hard. I've been thinking about many of you and my own life in recent weeks, for example, and there's quite a list of ways that we've waited or are still waiting. We're waiting for the election, and then it happened, and then we're waiting for results to be tabulated and certified. We're waiting for a vaccine that's safe and effective. In the meantime, we're waiting for COVID test results. Some are waiting for a baby to arrive. We wait for word from the hospital that our loved one is coming off the ventilator. We wait for that phone call or message to arrive. We wait for a tow truck when we go off the highway in the snow. We wait for kids to come home for Thanksgiving. We wait for the semester to be over. We wait for Christmas to come. We wait for medical treatments to begin or end or begin making a difference in our health. We wait for light to dawn. As the psalmist says, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in God's word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman waits for the morning. More than a watchman waits for the morning. Some of you are waiting for this sermon to end. It all comes down to waiting for the future to arrive. But have you noticed The future never comes. It never arrives except as the present. The present moment, the here and the now, it's all we have. It's all we ever have. And it is a gift. Perhaps that's why it's called the present. And because we're waiting for some future event, some arrival, we are hopeful. That's why the first Advent candle that we lit today was the candle of hope. We hope for a better future, for the present to give way to something newer and perhaps more desirable. And that's where faith comes in, right? We trust that in the long run, no matter what happens, all shall be well. It's what we wait for. That's a famous phrase from Julian of Norwich, all shall be well, all shall be well, all manner of things shall be well. You know, Julian of Norwich lived in the Middle Ages as a religious woman. And when I Googled her, I I got a nice essay from an Episcopal minister in Portland, Oregon. She reminded me that Julian's time was one of war and famine and plague. She lived during the bubonic plague, and she was very sick on a few occasions. Suffering was everywhere. Julian lived as an anchoress, a a monastic. She lived alone in a little cell that was attached to the side of the church. In other words, Julian lived in isolation during a pandemic. 
Sound familiar? During her illness, Julian received visions, and they've come to us as the revelations of divine love, or sometimes called the showings. Her famous phrase is really about a hazelnut. She described in one of her visions, and God showed me this little thing, the quantity of a hazelnut lying in the palm of my hand, as it seemed, and it was as round as any ball. I looked upon it with the eye of my understanding and thought, what may this be? And it was answered generally thus, it is all that is made. I marveled how that might last, for I thought that it might suddenly have fallen to nothing for littleness. And I was answered in my understanding, it lasts and ever shall, for God loves it. And so have all things their beginning by the love of God. And Julian goes on to say, in this little thing, I saw three properties. The first is that God made it. The second, that God loves it. And the third, that God keeps it. Julian looked around at the suffering all over, and she saw not the punishment of God, but the love of God extending into every nook and cranny to meet and find us in it. Nothing demonstrated this more than the example of Jesus himself. Just as we suffer, so did Jesus. God does not stay above the fray, so to speak, but enters into our suffering and solidarity. Julian realized that all shall be well. All shall be well. All manner of things shall be well. So this can be a mantra, a prayer, if you will, that we lean into even when we don't feel like it or see it. It's not a descriptive statement of now, but a hopeful statement of what shall be. It is as this Episcopal minister in Oregon, Lindsay Ross Hunt, points out, an Easter declaration. There will be life, holiness, peace, restoration. All shall be well. It's not to say everything's suddenly going to go back to normal after this pandemic. We may not be able to be together still for a long time. And it may be even longer before we can sing together. There's a lot to grieve. We have lost a lot. So there's this interesting tension here. On one hand, we have this prayer, all shall be well. Future oriented. It's a vision, not of how things are now, but how they shall be one day or how they already are in God's perfect time. On the other hand, the future never comes, but it's always the present. So it seems to me that we look forward to what shall be to guide us in our being and doing in the present moment. And so it's an active waiting. Uh, it requires vigilance. That leads me to the second W besides waiting, and that's watch. We watch. A character in J.D. Salinger's short story says, the most important word in the Bible is watch. Look around. Notice. See what's going on. Mary Oliver says the poet's job is three things. One, pay attention. Two, be astonished. And three, tell about it. The poets are good at this. They help us to see. Simone Weil said that attention without aim is the supreme form of prayer. Mary Oliver, after watching a grasshopper eat sugar out of the palm of her hand on a summer day, reflects, I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, she writes, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Mary Oliver's poem is about paying attention. It's an invitation to figure out what this wild and precious life is all about, which I think is about opening up our hearts to all that is. And that leads me to the third W, wake up. 
This is the essence of the spiritual life. Jesus was awake. And Buddhism understands this too, of course. The word Buddha means the awakened one. Jesus spoke a lot about staying awake and paying attention. Keep alert, he said. You don't know when the time will come. Keep awake. You don't know when the master of the house will return. And so I say to all, keep awake. Do you remember the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before Jesus was arrested? How very sleepy they were. They could not keep their eyes open. Jesus said to them, could you not stay awake with me for one hour? What causes such drowsiness? Fear, anxiety, depression, worry, eating too much. We can maybe blame it on the turkey, we try anyway. It's the tryptophan, that amino acid that made us sleepy. But honestly, there is not enough tryptophan in that meat to cause such drowsiness. More likely, it was the dessert. The carbs activated the insulin and the serotonin. And don't forget the role of alcohol in our diet, especially in this holiday season. Let those who have ears to hear, hear. It doesn't mean that you can't enjoy a good nap. I've read that many home office workers have learned to nap between their Zoom calls during the workday. Good for them. We should all nap more. But then when we wake up, let's really be awake. I'm talking about increasing our consciousness, opening our hearts to what's going on. I've been reading a book lately that I started a long time ago and forgot to finish. It's by Michael A. Singer called The Untethered Soul. And I so appreciate his writing. He says, our task is to stay open, open in the face of whatever's happening. Do not close up. Do not close your mind. Stay open. It's about accepting all that is. Singer points out how death is a great teacher. The fact that we will all die. He says, let's say you're living life without the thought of death. And the angel of death comes to you and says, come, it's time to go. And you say, but no. You're supposed to give me a warning so that I can decide what to do with my last week. I'm supposed to get one more week. Do you know what death will say to you? He'll say, my God, I gave you 52 weeks in this past year. And look at all the other weeks I've given you. Why would you need one more? What did you do with all of those? If asked that, what are you going to say? What will you answer? I wasn't paying attention. I didn't think it mattered. That's a pretty amazing thing to say about your life. We do well to try to honor and accept and appreciate the experiences unfolding in front of us, to marvel at what 13.8 billion years has brought to this time and place. You don't have to be in control. You don't have to figure it all out. We can't. We just have to be open and ready and participate in the experience that is unfolding before us. By God's grace, may that be more and more the case for you and me in this Advent season. Amen. This is the time in the service when we offer our prayers to God, when we settle in and we listen to what God has to say to us. Also a chance to hear what's happening in other people's lives and offer that up to God as well. We offer congratulations to Alexandra Nugent. She is the daughter of John and Denise Nugent, church members. She was married over the weekend to Vladimir and Pastor Jim officiated at the service, so we give thanks for that. Also, we offer prayers of healing. So many people in need right now. Uh, we keep Roger Hesse in our prayers. He was recently diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He has already started chemo treatments, and he's very optimistic that he will make a full recovery, but he's got a long road ahead of him. 
We have uh, set up some church members, Tanya and Julie have set up a food tree for him. And that has gone out in an email to people who might be interested. If you're interested in being, receiving that, just send me an email and I will get you connected into that. We keep the Hollister family. So good to have Jim back in Sheboygan after spending a week out in Connecticut with his dad. Pleased that his mother, Marge, is making progress. She's still in the hospital, but gets a little bit better every day. And we continue offer prayers for Marge Hollister. And Susie Mavis is recovering from surgery a week ago. We keep her in our prayers. Dennis Schrader offers, asks us to offer prayers for his friend Susan and her two children. And numerous people have COVID-related illnesses and challenges. Brian, Carol, Cindy, numerous teachers in the school system. We keep them all in our prayer. Let us enter into a time of quiet communion with God. Holy God, in this season of Advent, wake us up. Wake us up to your love and your longing to be intimately connected to our lives. Holy God, in this season of Advent, help us to be patient, to wait for your kingdom to come on earth. Help us to be channels of your compassion and care. Holy God, we, we watch for you we look for your presence in those around us. We watch for glimmers of your goodness in the small and large acts of kindness. May we be faithful followers in this season. May we bring good news to a world that has great need. And we pray all these things in the name of your son who taught us to pray saying, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we have a final song. Jeff Britton and Lisa Kepsel are going to be singing a song called Light a Candle. Enjoy. Light a candle For the old man Staring out a frosty window pane, light a candle for the woman who is lonely, and every Christmas it's the same for the children who need more than presents can bring. Light a candle, light the dark, light the world. Light a candle for you. Light a candle for the homeless and the hungry. A little shelter from the cold. Light a candle for the 
As our benediction, let us hear these words from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans. May the God of faith and encouragement renew you to live in harmony with each other in the spirit of Christ, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God that others might glorify God for the mercy shown us all. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>